let's see now. <clears throat> we can wait a few minutes that people slowly join us. Nobody's, no, nobody's joining us. <laughs> okay, now here comes the first one. Yeah, perfect. Let's wait a few minutes that, um, that people uh, join us. Okay, now we already can. Yeah, perfect. Now they, it probably took us a second to, okay, okay. Now we are exponentially increasing the numbers. Yeah. Okay, let's wait um, uh, a few, uh, another minute <clears throat> and, then, and then we can start. Yeah. Okay, there are still a few people joining. Okay, now it's, we are reaching uh, an, an equilibrium. So maybe let, let, let's start now and if a few people join us later, it's okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon in our uh, NITEP uh, seminar series. <clears throat> and today we're very happy to have Mark Fingerhut with us. <clears throat> who will speak about uh, quantum open source development. Yeah, and uh, uh, we are all very proud of him because he, during his academic career, he spent some time at UK Z10 and then he became a very famous entrepreneur, in uh, quantum entrepreneur in, in, in Canada. Yeah, but he's still uh, quite academic and, um, and we are very happy that he will share some of his experiences today, today with us. Mark, I know that you have a slide introducing yourself, so please, <laughs> you can share your screen and, um, and start. All right, thanks Francesco, and hi everyone. Um, first of all, everyone, anyone who has been here um, two weeks ago when I failed to attend uh, because of the time shift, sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna be talking about quantum open source software development, and just to give you a quick um, outline of the talk, I'm um, quickly going to talk about myself, then talk more generally about what it means to do open source software development. Um, and then I compiled a list of quantum computing software projects that I thought um, could be of interest uh, to anyone attending. Um, and then I want to talk about the Quantum Open Source Foundation, what we do, what our goals are, and how you can potentially get involved if you want to. So quickly about myself, um, I did a bachelor in liberal arts and sciences in the Netherlands at Maastricht University, and I wrote my thesis um, at UKZN on quantum enhanced machine learning together with Maria and Francesco. And after that, I moved to Canada in 2017 and co-founded the startup Protein Cure, which has a Q in its name because uh, we are focused on kind of trying to develop algorithms, quantum algorithms, for specific use cases in biotechnology. And uh, last year, I co-founded the Quantum Open Source Foundation together with Peter Wittek and Tomasz, and that's um, gonna be what I'm talking about today. And I'm currently, next to the work that I'm doing at Protein Cure, uh, pursuing a master's in theoretical physics at UKZN. Um, so I wanna dive right in and talk about open source software development not with respect to quantum computing right now, but just more generally um, to kind of get everyone on the same page, what it actually means. If there are any questions, please let me know um, or just write them in the Q&A chat. Um, so I'm happy to answer them as I go through the slide deck. So the first of all, like what does it actually mean to open source code? Um, a lot of people think that just uploading a piece of code to GitHub and making it public is what it means to open source a code base. However, the problem is that that is not right because just uploading your code to GitHub is actually not enough to make your code openly accessible to everyone. Because what a lot of people don't know is that public code that has no license attached to it actually falls under default copyright law, which means that it is still proprietary and technically not free to be used, shared or modified by anyone else even if it is for non-commercial or research purposes. And I think that's something especially important for us researchers to kind of be aware of, that if we make code accessible, um, but we don't attach a license, technically other researchers are not allowed to extend our work and kind of create derivative work or publications of that piece of code. 
And so if you haven't really looked into what the different licenses do, uh, just kind of a quick overview of what we have. There's permissive licenses and there's copyleft licenses. These are kind of the two main groups. And permissive licenses, the kind of most um, famous participant there is MIT license. And the MIT license essentially allows anyone to use the code in any way they want, um, except that they are not allowed to sue the author of the code. Um, so they're very open licenses and kind of enabling free use of that piece of software, whereas copyleft licenses are a little bit more radical. So for example, if you attach an LGPL license to your code, it means that any derivative work of this piece of code also has to be open source. Um, so it, it's really helpful, or like even GPL v2, or like these kind of licenses are enabling you, if you believe in open source software, to kind of force everyone else to open source that software as well and prevent companies from taking that piece of code and using it in their internal technology stack. So if you're unsure and you don't want to dive into the specifics, attaching an MIT license to your code is generally a good approach unless you're somehow worried about the intellectual property attached to it. So then why would you open source in the first place? I think the, the first main reason is that other people can study the source code of the software that they use. And so that essentially gives everyone more control and um, a better sense of security. Because for example, Zoom has had a lot of controversy around uh, safety and security with respect to their users. Now imagine the code base would be openly accessible. That would mean that a lot of people and a lot of programmers could actually analyze the code and determine if there's some security loopholes or backdoors inside the code base. And so it, it generally enhances security and it allows people to implement features if they're missing. So let's say you're working with a particular quantum simulator package and you're missing a particular gate or some, something that kind of prevents you from doing your research, you can just go and implement that feature and contribute it to the code base. Um, so it kind of generally leads to a community driven system where people support each other and kind of extend software in a free and open way. So what would be the, op the motivation for you personally to make your project open source? Um, I think as a scientist, um, it's especially important to kind of uh, remember that it does improve the reproducibility of your research um, in the sense that if you have written a piece of code to generate the results for your paper and you publish that alongside your publication, it allows everyone to rerun these computations and it also increases the impact and publicity. And this is not just me saying that, but it has actually been found in this paper that I'm citing here, where they analyze thousands of open source repos, that generally it makes it easier for other scientists to pick up where you left off and start extending and creating derivative work. It generally helps to also gain credit and increase human capital by being able to kind of show off the pieces of code that you wrote and uh, GitHub and GitLab both have become quite important when it comes of, uh, to hiring. So if you ever wanna switch careers and, and apply for software engineering roles, it generally is important to kind of have a, a good GitHub profile that showcases your ability. And as a company, it usually builds community and an ecosystem. So for example, what we see in the quantum space is that IBM, for example, by building Piskit and launching hackathons and all kinds of things around it, what they're doing is they're building an ecosystem and creating a large user base around their software, which essentially is also giving them um, free developers because people are now freely extending the piece of software that they started developing. So at this point, I'd like to make a, a, a quick parallel to machine learning. Um, if you ask yourself what actually made machine learning so successful, a lot of people say, well, it's probably because the hardware has advanced a lot and we've seen kind of an increase in uh, the, the size of GPUs that are available on the market, as well as research has advanced and people have come up with new algorithms. But I would like to suggest, oops, sorry. Where's that other slide? Okay, sorry. Um, I'd like to suggest that it's, it's also about the, the open source software um, that has been developed as part of the machine learning community, which really made it super easy for people to access and use um, machine learning models. So for example, if you want to learn TensorFlow and write a deep neural network using it, you can probably do a tutorial and within a day, you can use Jupyter to spin up a web-based Python interface and you can write a deep neural network in a couple of lines. 
And making it that easy and accessible, I think, has kind of contributed to the proliferation of machine learning quite a lot. So sorry, my slides are kind of messed up here. Um, so I want to kind of finish off this section with a very interesting uh, realization. So there's a, a law that is um, that has been established, which people kind of say that adding human resources to a late software project makes it later. Um, it, it kind of boils down to the law of diminishing returns, where you keep adding developers to your project, you get more and more productive, you have more and more um, commits in your code base. But at some point, adding more developers actually starts decreasing the performance and the output because suddenly you have communication overhead and all kinds of problems associated with a big team. And so what I personally find interesting is that open source software does not show this um, law to be true in the sense that the more people are added to an open source software project, you generally see an increase in productivity. Um, and, and this has been uh, basically also analyzed in this paper that I'm citing here. And I think really shows that there's something about this asynchronous way of developing open source software that kind of tries to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that we see in big companies. So I hope that I kind of gave you a good overview of what it means to develop code in the open. And now I want to give a couple of examples in various um, different fields and areas um, of open source projects in quantum computing. So I want to start it off with quantum simulators. I specifically wanted to pick some projects that you probably have not heard about so far, because I don't want to talk about all the big frameworks that are out there like Qiskit and Circ and so on. But when it comes to quantum simulators, a lot of times the default simulators in those big packages don't tend to be very performant. And that's why I picked these two projects here. On the left side, we have Yao JL, which is a quantum simulator implemented in Julia, very focused on uh, performance. And you can see that in the benchmark, um, they're doing quite well compared to Qiskit, Project Q, and Penny Lane, and so on. And if you're interested in Julia, or if you have been developing code in Julia, I highly recommend looking at it. It also has the ability to kind of take derivatives of your code, which allows you to implement essentially like a Penny Lane-esque kind of thing, where you can connect, where you can take the machine learning library equivalent in Julia and connect it with Yao to, for example, develop quantum variational circuits. On the right side, we have QC GPU, which is a GPU-based quantum simulator um, that is also very much focused on performance. Um, so if you have GPUs available, or if you want to just simulate larger quantum computers and you see other simulators running out of steam, you might want to consider having a look at this. By the way, are there any questions so far? I don't really see the question mark. Oh, Amira. JKQ DD Sim, what that is. Um, frankly, I don't know. I took that screenshot from their uh, GitHub page. I know a lot of the other packages. I don't know what that one is. I think it might is a simulator that comes out of a Japanese research institute. If you go to their GitHub page, there should be um, a piece of code that actually generates this benchmark. So you can probably look it up. So the next topic is uh, quantum internet simulators. Um, this is something very interesting. Um, I personally find it very interesting and thrilling because it deals with the idea of having multiple quantum computers that are um, able to communicate between each other. And it kind of opens up a whole new world of quantum algorithms that can be potentially developed. Um, so on the right side, we have a software package called Simulacron. It comes uh, out of the University of Delft, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's, it comes out of the quantum internet aliens that they formed. And it really allows you to kind of simulate different nodes and use virtual qubits and sort of like shared um, registers between quantum computers to develop algorithms. And uh, I know one of the core developers, he's been at the open source conference that we're organizing for two years in a row. And one thing that they are um, struggling with is finding good algorithms and applications for this sort of software package. So if that's something that you're interested in, highly recommend checking it out and uh, potentially developing some algorithms with it. And on the left side, we have Squanch, which is also um, a simulator for quantum internet that um, 
well, I have personally not used it, but it also has these sort of shared classical registers and separate quantum computers that you can simulate on one machine and kind of um, have network connections between them. So when it comes to quantum theory, um, two packages that I found personally very interesting is on the right side uh, called PIX, um, which is a simulator for open, open quantum systems. And on the left side, QSpin, which is a simulator for bosonic and fermionic systems. Um, so if this is an area that you work in, you might have come across them. If not, I highly recommend checking them out. Specifically, PIX was developed by a co-developer of Q-Tip. Um, then I have two very exotic simulators. So on the left side, we have QTOP, which is a simulator for topological quantum computers. Um, when I last looked at the repo two weeks ago, it seems like that um, repo is not longer maintained. So if that's something that you're interested in potentially picking up or extending or making sure that it stays up to date, uh, you might want to have a look at that. And on the right side, um, we have TNQVM, which is a tensor network based quantum simulator um, that is also very much focused on performance. And uh, Penny Lane actually recently started implementing a tensor network simulator, not this one, but their own one um, that has shown quite a lot of performance improvements. So if you work on tensor networks, you might want to have a look at this one. When it comes to quantum annealing, um, D-Wave has kind of pushed a lot of code um, open source on their own GitHub. Um, on the left side, I'm showing you the um, kind of an, an illustration of the Chimera graph and the repo that they released is called Minor Minor, which uh, allows you to do minor graph embeddings. So it's one of the crucial steps when implementing an algorithm on the quantum annealer. You usually have a Hamiltonian um, that does not naturally fit onto the Chimera architecture. So you need to first do what's called a minor graph embedding. And uh, this piece of software, Minor Minor, helps you do that in a uh, performant way. And on the right side, um, we have a converter that allows you to write uh, code in Ver Verilog, which is a, I would say, probably a rather exotic um, programming language. And it allows you to translate from Verilog code to a physical Hamiltonian, which you could then use um, to run through the minor graph embedding and run a computation on the quantum annealer. Um, there's many more uh, repos, especially with respect to quantum annealing. So if you're working in this area, you might want to check them out. Another topic that I like to talk about is kind of the, what I call the elephant in the quantum room, in a sense that uh, we are lacking some sort of standardization because there's all these different hardware providers out there that are all developing their own piece of software that you have to use in order to interact with their hardware. And that makes it quite difficult for software developers or even researchers, because if you want to port it from like, let's say IonQ to uh, Rigetti, you have to completely rewrite all your code. Um, and I think what, what we really need is something that kind of unifies that. And there's two projects that I want to highlight that do essentially do that. There's XACC, um, which kind of has backends to IBM, Rigetti, D-Wave, and this Tensor Network um, based simulator. And there's Project Q, um, which also has various backends to the, all the different uh, QPU vendors. And it allows you to write your algorithm one time and run it on all these different architectures. So if you want to do a benchmark for your algorithm on all the different ones, you might want to consider one of these frameworks rather than um, implementing them by hand. So then another diff, uh, important topic, I think, is quantum compilers. This is some uh, area where we see quite a lack of open projects. Um, most of the compilers tend to be implemented and kept open source by the hardware providers. Um, and that's why like, this is something that we're really trying to push and make the community aware of, that if people want to get into quantum open source development, that quantum compilers is maybe something they want to consider because writing yet another simulator is probably not that necessary because there's already a wealth of them. So on the left side, we have the PyZX compiler, which uses the PyZX calculus, um, and it creates these sort of, um, they're called, I think, spider diagrams. Um, and it uses this particular type of calculus in order to try and condense your quantum circuits. Um, there has been quite a lot of work been done on that repo. So if you 
face a lot of compiler problems in your daily work, you might want to have a look. And on the right side, we have the universal Q compiler, which is a Mathematica package um, that helps you to compile a circuit of any kind of gates into um, C naught gates and single qubit gates only. Um, so it is universal in that sense because it essentially just tries to like use the most universal gate set and compile everything to that. Um, so if you work a lot in Mathematica, this might be a package for you. Um, then there is also fun topics, um, what we call quantum games. Um, on the left side, it's called the quantum game. Um, so if you find yourself a little bit bored in the quarantine times, you might want to check out quantumgame.io. It's very nicely done. Um, it's basically a game that is um, kind of playing with the topics of uh, photonic quantum computing. So you have beam splitters and all the kind of like um, experimental pieces that you can place on a grid in order to kill these green monsters that you can see here. So it's quite fun and it teaches you a lot of the topics that are associated uh, with photonic quantum computation. And on the right side, we have Block It, which is um, actually an Android app that allows two players to do a turn-based quantum circuit game. So player one places a gate on a quantum circuit, then player two uh, plays a gate, and it goes back and forth. And the goal for player one is to maximize uh, the qubits in the zero state, and player one wants to maximize so player one wants to maximize zeros, player two wants to maximize ones. Um, so it's quite a fun game that is aimed to kind of help people develop an intuition for quantum circuits and what certain gates do to your quantum states. So this concludes this section on um, various quantum open source software projects. And I'd like to talk about the Quantum Open Source Foundation specifically. But first I wanna check if there's any questions. I don't see any. Okay, so then I'll continue. So the Quantum Open Source Foundation essentially started with a small GitHub project. Back in the day, um, I started um, basically compiling all the open source quantum software projects that we have out there. Um, I wanna quickly, let's see, show you this. Can you see the browser? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, by now it's hosted on the QSF website. And essentially what you see here is kind of it's split up into all the various categories, some of the categories that I just talked about. So if you're curious what kind of quantum simulators are out there, you can see that they're actually separated by programming language. So if you, I don't know, tend to write common Lisp code, maybe you might want to look at these two projects. If you're more a Julia person, there's various simulators here. And so I highly recommend you to kind of check out what's out there because there's really a wealth of software projects that might help you um, doing your daily research more efficiently. Um, so it basically started out with this project and it started out with uh, kind of a set of publications that um, I worked on that were based on all the various um, hardware providers that are out there and kind of using their various QPUs in a very applied fashion and kind of profiting a lot from this idea of um, quantum software being openly accessible. Um, and so what eventually happened is that the journal PLOS One um, asked Peter, Tomasz and me to write a review paper about the open source software landscape. And so what we did as part of this paper is to essentially go through um, a selected few quantum open source projects and kind of try to create an objective way of measuring their quality. Um, so we analyzed their code base and kind of figured out like how, uh, like what's the quality level of the code that these projects wrote. And then we also analyzed the documentation, which you can see on the right side and kind of try to create this heat map that um, should ideally illustrate and, and help these projects identify weaknesses in their uh, documentation and then go out and improve that um, as well as help newcomers in the field to kind of understand what's out there and which of these projects because it can be quite um, overwhelming to see all these different simulators and not understanding what the trade-offs are and the differences are and kind of with this review paper we want to um, enable people to have an easier entry to the field and understand the trade-offs. 
So what the problem was that a review paper is essentially getting outdated quite quickly because we, we for example, analyze these documentations, people go and improve them, and even the, the code quality has improved a lot uh, as a result of this paper. And so things get out of date. And so what we started doing is we started publishing this on a website, which was kind of the beginning of the Quantum Open Source Foundation to have sort of an ongoing leaderboard um, of all these quantum open source projects. Um, so we're currently in the process of updating that again and, and publishing a revised version. Um, and so yeah, the, the response was overwhelming and we started kind of expanding the idea of the Quantum Open Source Foundation and really wanted to build something that, that supports people working on these kind of projects and enables researchers um, to also like publish their code open source and, and maybe even collaborate on projects rather than everyone just starting their individual projects. And so this is um, basically the QSF core team. Um, Mikal from Zapata recently joined us. Um, and we also had a new addition to the team. Uh, she's called Maggie, joined uh, last week or two weeks ago. And she's helping us um, with a lot of the outreach and communication. So we're also building um, our advisory board right now. So far, we have uh, Will Zhang from Unitary Fund and Josh from Xanadu. Um, one person from Rigetti is soon going to join, and we're trying to kind of build a, an advisory board that is a mix out of uh, academia and industry that can help us kind of figure out what, what events um, make sense in the near term. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the projects that we're working on, kind of give us advice and academic input on a lot of the topics that we're working on. So at this point, I'd like to highlight that without Peter, the Quantum Open Source Foundation would not exist. Um, he was kind of one of, like he, he kind of helped push us um, and, and make us stay on track when it comes to like really working on that in our free time. Unfortunately, he um, went missing after a um, expedition in the Himalayas. Um, and since then, we've kind of really tried to step up our efforts even more because it was something that he cared about a lot and we just want to make sure that this sort of legacy is carried forward. So what actually is QOSF? QOSF's mission is basically the supporting of the development and standardization of open tools for quantum computing. Um, it's a community effort between academia and industry, and it's all supposed to happen in the open. Um, and we really wanna kind of get more people into the community as well as uh, help the people that are already inside the community to navigate the space more easily. So in terms of our mission and goals, we basically identified three pillars. The first one being open research challenges. And I'm gonna talk about each of them individually. Second one is outreach and education. And the third one is benchmarks and analysis. So the first pillar, um, pushing the boundaries basically means the open research challenges where the idea is that we want to collect problems that are outstanding in the quantum community and publish them on our website and helping people. Like I, I sometimes get emails and people asking, oh, what are, what are interesting topics to work on in the quantum open source space? Like, which of, like, what are outstanding software problems? And so, for example, what I was mentioning earlier, that there's a lack of compilers, is something that is not widely known and, and not written down anywhere. And so we're really trying to kind of engage our advisory board as well as our wider network to kind of find outstanding problems and, and problems that people can work on um, through various grants or mentorship programs that we're running. Um, so yeah, this is basically ideal for young researchers kind of looking for interesting bite-side challenges. Um, it, it should not just include completely new things, but even if there's like a big issue that is open on one of the big uh, projects, and they need someone to work on that because they don't have capacity. Um, kind of like having some central resource where people can look these up. And uh, ideally, working on these uncracked problems should result in open access papers and open source software accompanying that research. So if you know any challenges that you would like to see featured, um, once we publish that list, please reach out to me um, and let me know, because that would be great. Uh, it's supposed to be a community effort, and it's really about like making um, it easier for us to kind of crack these problems and have people work on them. And maybe some of them are actually more easily solved by a software engineer rather than a theoretical physicist. 
So then the outreach and education component, uh, spreading the knowledge, is all about growing the community of quantum developers, uh, specifically by exposing classical software engineers to the concepts of quantum physics. Because I do think that um, what we're missing in the field is people coming in it with a mindset from software engineering and helping us really figure out some of the engineering problems associated with some things. So for example, boosting the performance of a quantum simulator uh, might be something that a software engineer can help out on, on the software level, collaborating with a theoretical physicist who can maybe work out different techniques of making this more performant. So as part of this um, goal, we are organizing hackathons and workshops. Um, and I'm specifically interesting in kind of interested in reaching out to uh, people that would usually not get exposed. So that means hackathons with quantum newbies, as I call them, people that don't have any formal background in quantum computing. Workshop with kids uh, is one of my dreams that I uh, want to do. Well, I wanted to do it this year, but COVID might have made that impossible. And also what we're planning to do is an evening symposium for the retired population, because who says that they shouldn't understand or like have the ability to kind of dive into some of these topics uh, if they're interested. And so the, the main idea here is that one to two days are enough to run your first program on a QPU. It doesn't have to be complicated, but just the kind of experience of having done it um, is very exciting to a lot of people. And we've actually seen uh, quite a lot of people coming out of these hackathons and then going on and contributing to projects and, and teaming up with researchers and, and kind of working on this in their free time. So if, if you know um, how and where to get more funding for such projects, which we're always looking for, like especially when it comes to hackathons and workshops, it does cost money. So if you know resources for uh, nonprofits, um, please let us know. We're always interested in, in kind of learning about that. So as an example, one thing that we did is we teamed up with CERN. Uh, last year, we launched a hackathon called the Quantum Futures Hackathon where um, it was about kind of like bringing artists and designers, game designers and developers into the field of quantum computing. Uh, we hosted it at the Fields Institute and um, we were quite happy with the turnout and Block It, that um, app that uh, enables two players to kind of battle each other on a quantum circuit was one of the outcomes of this uh, hackathon. Um, another thing is that on the QOSF GitLab and GitHub page, you can find all the resources associated with the massively open online course on quantum machine learning that was organized by Peter. Um, the course is available on EDX and it should be restarted sometime in July or August, I believe. So if you're interested in that, um, even before that, you can look at all the exercises on our GitLab page. Um, another important topic and pillar is kind of when it comes to education and outreach is making a, a people able to find learning resources. There is a wealth of free quantum learning resources out there. And in this paper, Making Quantum Computing Open, Lessons from Open Source Projects, they said that they observe a lack of educational resources on quantum computing, which is something that I disagree with. I think that it might be difficult to find those resources, uh, but they are out there. And uh, Desiree from Australia, she started a um, GitHub page, um, and we mirrored that on the QSF website with her help, uh, which is basically a list of all free and open learning resources on quantum computing, reaching from textbooks to Jupyter notebooks to online courses to code documentation. Um, so if there's any topics that, uh, that you want to learn about more, you might want to check out our website or her GitHub repo. So currently ongoing uh, is a quantum computing mentorship program where we have mentors that are generally people from academia or industry that have worked in the field for um, a minimum of three years. And we team them up with quantum newbies that want to work on a quantum project and they work on, uh, well, the, the participant, the mentee works on a project for three months and has monthly check-ins with that mentor um, trying to kind of unblock certain problems that they're facing. Um, so we've just seen the first result of that, which was a new tutorial to Penny Lane, and there's going to be some more results coming out of that in the next couple of weeks. So the goal is to build a community of quantum enthusiasts and kind of providing a smooth and guided entry point for people that don't really know where to get started or where to get the support from when they run into problems. 
And at that point, I'd like to run a little ad. Um, so Unitary Fund, we're working with them uh, quite a lot. And what they do is they um, offer 4,000 US dollar cash grants uh, for projects that help develop the quantum technology ecosystem. Um, and so if you're interested in getting one of these grants, uh, I highly check, uh, highly recommend going to their website, look at the um, program. You can come up with your own idea. It can be developing a piece of quantum software, making educational material, running a workshop. Um, their definition of what it takes to get a grant is very wide. And they also made it in such a way that writing a proposal is really just filling out a short form and making a two minute video about yourself. Um, so I highly recommend you looking at that um, if you're interested, which is something that you can do next to your research, for example. Um, on the outreach thing, we are planning to do a decentralized quantum conference. Um, we actually planned that before COVID-19 hit, um, but now it seems even more relevant. Uh, where well, the idea is it should be kind of like a PyCon, which is the conference for Python software, but for quantum computing software. Um, so the idea is that we have a um, camera equipment that we're sending around to people, um, and they record um, a little talk about their piece of software and ideally also demo it to some extent and, and kind of show the community what's out there and how to use their piece of software to just kind of um, expose them to a wider audience. Um, so we are long, like we are um, doing the FOSTEM conference, which is an open source conference in Belgium every year, but we don't think that that is enough because that's very local to Europe and we want to make this more widely accessible. So if you happen to be a pro at video editing, please let us know if you're interested in helping us out with some of this uh, work associated to this quantum conference. And lastly, we have the benchmarks and analytics uh, leveling the playing field, where we are trying to provide objective reference points to evaluate uh, both quantum hardware and software. So what does that mean? Um, we basically want to create, and we're currently working on that, compiler and simulator benchmarks. Um, because there's so many simulators out there, and the question is, which of them is best at whatever job you want to do? So for example, you might want to simulate a quantum circuit with Clifford gates only. Um, there's probably a simulator that is much faster on that task than other ones. And so you might want to know which one that is, or you want to understand which of these simulator packages provides the best CPU parallelism, or has GPU acceleration, or runs in the browser, or is optimized for a certain quantum architecture. There's many different questions that you might have. And uh, similar to how here in this uh, picture, they've been um, benchmarking uh, C++ compilers. We want to also benchmark quantum compilers and give you an idea as to which compiler is better at what task and for what circuits. And just kind of like creating a central point where people can go and look. Um, so this is what we call the QOSF gym. It's essentially a virtual gym for new quantum simulators and compilers. So think of it as kind of like a standardized data set similar to MNIST where um, this data set contains quantum circuits that need to be compiled. That data set of circuits has ideally been composed by a wide network of researchers and people from industry, and is kind of an, a good starting point for everyone developing a new model. Similar to how in machine learning, if you develop a new model, you kind of have some standard data sets that you're testing it on. So we are looking for help uh, on developing on this QSF gym. So if you're interested, this might actually be something that we could apply for a micro grant at Unitary Fund in order to um, help you out financially to kind of help us uh, develop this QSF gym. And lastly, then there's the open source project evaluation, which is what I was talking about earlier, the outcome of that review paper, where it's all about evaluating the code, uh, as well as the documentation of open source quantum projects. Um, and uh, so what we've recently done is we partnered with the Unitary Fund to create a biannual quantum open source software price, where the goal is to reward outstanding contribution to the field of open quantum software. Um, so we're currently kind of working on, on that and we're going to start um, a form where people can propose and nominate people that they think deserve this prize. Uh, it's going to be a cash prize and it's really supposed to highlight some of the individual developers that have contributed meaningfully to the, um, to the field. 
So if you want to get involved, uh, involved with the Quantum Open Source Foundation, there's a couple of things that we're currently looking for. We are looking for uncracked challenges um, in quantum software, but also quantum theory more widely. We're looking for help with video editing for the uh, Q conference. Uh, tell your friends that are interested in quantum computing about the mentorship program that we're running. And if you're interested in helping us develop the cures at Jim, please reach out. And on our website, you can become a supporter, which basically means uh, signing up to a mailing list. And I highly recommend you also join our Slack channel, where there's various channels on the different software packages. You can ask questions. There's uh, discussions happening um, around all kinds of projects and how to program quantum computers. That's it from my side. If there's any questions, please let me know. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much for the excellent and very informative, uh, uh, informative talk. Uh, I think our audience was quite um, timid uh, and shy today, but since uh, we, we have around 20, um, 20, 25 people in the audience, I would like to encourage them to raise their hand and, and ask their question in, in, in person. And once I see that they raise their hand, I can give them the permission to talk. So please, um, start asking questions. <clears throat> maybe Mark, maybe people think about a question, just a, 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 a stupid one. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what is, uh, how would you, where, where would you fit Q sharp in all these uh, these open source software categories. Mm -hmm. um, we put that into like there's a category that we kind of created out of nowhere called quantum full stack libraries, uh -huh. uh, which for us are software packages that kind of go all the way from writing a quantum circuit to compiling it to s simulating it, and that's Q sharp essentially. So Q sharp falls into that category. Um, of quantum full stack libraries on the same level as CERC uh, or Forest um, or Quizkit. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And does it have many followers except outside Microsoft <laughs> or not really? I, I have not seen that much work on it, but um, I think what, like one problem why we hadn't listed it for quite a while is because it wasn't truly open source. Yeah. And then recently they changed a lot of the uh, licenses on, on the various pieces of code and made it more accessible. So that's why we started listing it. Um, I, I don't know about the size of the community, to be honest. Yeah. No, because at the last summer school that we organized in January, we had uh, uh, a representative of Microsoft and they advertised heavily Q Sharp, but uh, outside that closed gremium of people it doesn't seem to be super popular yeah yeah i agree yeah. so i have one question from maria what is your favorite quantum software framework um well it used to be forest um because i really liked kind of the the way that they designed their python api and um i personally found it was very easy to use um, so that's Rigetti's software stack for anyone who doesn't know. Um, but then recently they kind of started changing it in a way that you now have to use their quantum machine image on their cloud um, and running it, stuff locally becomes more tedious. So it, I'm kind of shifting away from it. Um, and uh, recently I started using Penny Lane a lot, which I'm sure you're happy to hear that I like that a lot and I, I think it's very easy to use and that's why that's currently my favorite. But it obviously doesn't necessarily is as general as Forest, for example. Okay, then uh, Mark, while people still think, I have another question. Um, you know, for, for some time I was a, a fan of Project Q. Is it still quite mm -hmm. active? Well, there, there was uh, a little bit of an issue because some of the, or like I think all of the main developers left to some company and stopped working on it. But I think there have recently have been new people that started picking it up and maintaining it. So I think it's still alive, but there was kind of in the meantime, a little bit of a down period. So they might still be in need of some updates when it comes to 
the quantum backends. Okay, okay. And I think there is a new question that just popped up. Um, there is a question by, uh, sorry, Maria, I've taken over your, your job. I just saw it. Uh, there's a question by, by, by uh, uh, Luyanda. Uh, what advice would you give for someone who, um, who wants to specialize in quantum computing? So for a new entry in quantum computing. What would I recommend? Um, I guess if you're completely new to the field, like I, I definitely recommend you go to our website and check out the free learning resources. Um, I personally am a big fan of quantum.country, which is the newest project by Michael Nielsen, uh, which is just like some very easy to digest essays that kind of introduce you to a lot of the concepts of quantum computing. And then I personally would pick a software package um, that has very good documentation and kind of explore the area of quantum computing through the applied lens, like really kind of implementing some quantum gates, seeing how they affect the quantum state that comes out of your computation. And a lot of the documentation of some of the quantum full stack libraries, for example, Forest, um, kind of take you by the hand and work you through some small scale examples. And I personally, that's my way of learning uh, in an applied manner. So if that resonates with you, I recommend doing that. Yeah, do we have more raised hands? <clears throat> Doesn't seem to be the case, Mark. So <clears throat> maybe if people want to uh, keep interacting with you, they, they, they have all your contact details, they, they, they might uh, get in touch with you. So Mark, sure. thank, you, thank, you, thank you so much for the, the, the very informative talk. Uh, we will try to get involved as much as we can because we've always been supported of, supportive of, uh, of open source. <clears throat> and um, yeah, and we are looking uh, to, to forward to, uh, I just wanted to say to stay in touch, although that's not very uh, <laughs> appropriate in COVID times. <laughs> yeah, but at least to, 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 keep, uh, to keep interacting uh, on, a, on, 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 a regular, on a regular basis. And hopefully one day you will be able to visit us again in Durban. Awesome. So, so Mark, thank you. Thank you very much again. And um, have a, I think the day is just starting for you. So have a good rest of the day. And to all the others, have a good weekend. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks and for having thank me. Maria and thank you, Ilya, as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.